But I think the main things is at the end of the day, volleyball is volleyball. It's in the same nine by nine court, and the rules are the same. So we. Uh, <laughs> Is that on the back of your shirt? Yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah something like that. You did, you did. A little free shout out for you. Um, and it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the net. You need to still execute to the best of your ability if you want a chance to win. That is right, Brett Walsh. Welcome back, boys and girls, to the 9 by 9 the 81 square meters of the best volleyball coverage on the internet. It is Monday, April 15th, 2024. This is episode 117. 117. My name, my name is Rob St. Clair, live from Chicago. That is Everett DeLorme, live from Toronto. Everett, the impossible has happened. Vero Volley Monza. For one, they avenge their women's embarrassing performance in the semifinals, which we'll certainly get to. But their men, the Vero Volimonza men, reached the Italian Scudetto finals for the first time in their club's history. They were down two to nothing in the series against arguably the best team on planet Earth. And with their backs against the wall, they completed an all-time comeback in the series. And they won a fifth set in match five. 1750 to eliminate Trentino and to move on to take on Perugia in the final. This is insane. We have a lot to get to, but I know Everett, <laughs> that you have a lot of things to say, given the fact that this team is comprised primarily of three Canadians. Everett DeLorme, what would you like to say to the people about this Vero Volley Monza achievement? Oh, wow. Well, thank you, Rob. Um, I mean, I've been celebrating. For any of those who uh, have been around the Discord and most notably on the I Italy section, uh, you know I've been running my mouth a little bit, uh, and I think it's well-deserved. Uh, let's be honest, for the first time ever in Canadian volleyball history, we have not only one, but two players who have led a team to the finals of arguably the best league in the world. Um, this was unconscionable for me 10 years ago. Uh, before Canadians played regularly in the Superlega. And this was unconscionable for me a week ago, right, Rob? When they won game number three in five, I still wasn't sure, right? I, I, I still, I didn't start believing until they won game number four, right? That was a, a dominant win, and it kind of put Trento in their places. I mean, that last set, you see it right there. Rob just put it up 25-11. It was dominant. And... I mean, this team came into this match, dominated sets one and two. They were up 10-5 in the third. And I thought I, it was a three-dong. I thought it was a three-dong, too. There was one play that made it 10-8, and it would have made it 11-7. It was a massive rally. Galassi made a block, played it off his foot. There was a back and forth, and Lepke just missed it um in that rally and i thought that given the nature of the rally and the way they kept it alive if lefty had killed it there it would have been 11 7 in the third down 2-0 they just stopped your run like it would have been emotionally over for me for for trentino but trento fought back nicely but it was an incredible fifth set overall for me, when I look at this, well, a lot of the shit talk I was doing in the Discord was due to the fact that Ran Takahashi was named MVP for this one. And I think if you've watched this show at all, you'll understand that that was not a decision made based off of merit and, and performance. I'm not saying Ran had a terrible game. I said I think he had a, a perfectly fine game. But when you look at the, the, the stats, and I mean, hell, if you even look at the eye test, Ray was not the MVP uh, of that match. Oh, not when even you look at, When you look at the stats, it's even cool. It's it's not even closer. I mean, 19 points is, is still fantastic. He was 19 for 38, but he was only a plus five uh, in the match. Um, only had 17 serves, which is tied for the lowest in the team. Only got 13 targets uh, in serve receive. He passed well in those 13, but only, only got 13. No blocks, um, no, no aces just kind of weird that they would go out and give Rantak a hash. Well, obviously um, the MVP. We, we know why that was actually done now. Well, he, I mean, he, he got the match winning kill to his credit. And also yes. uh, obviously this is just volleyball world's absolute dream come true. And I I'm, I'm watering that down from what I actually want to say, but um, <laughs> we got to talk about this actual match because like somebody yes. just pointed out in the chat, Peter, uh, Trentino is in very serious danger right here of assembling one of the very best teams of all time and winning zero trophies. Remember, they failed to win the Super Cup. They failed to win the Italian Cup. They were upset by this Monza team in the semifinals of that tournament. 
and they have now failed to defend their Italian Scudetto title after being the one seed um, and dominating the regular season and being, in my opinion, which I still will stand by, being one of the best teams in all of volleyball this entire season. And I, now I, their, I, o- their only chance left is Champions League, and we'll certainly talk to, about that over the next couple of weeks. But they have a third-place series to play now to guarantee a Champions League spot for next year. But uh, Trentino-wise, uh, up 2 nothing in the series – and playing two of those final three games at home that they lost, this is a failure for them, for sure. I, I would I would fully agree that this is a, fail, a failure for Trentino. I mean, uh, uh, Podraskinen and a few other of them, of, of them did interviews on the stream kind of afterwards in, into the crowd, and they were just talked about that they didn't level up their game after playing in Modena. And, then, and that's exactly, they kind of just like waffled. In, in, into the series. I would push back on saying that this is one of the greatest teams of all times. I think stats-wise... I, I wise, think I said that. This year, they were clearly this one of the year, best teams in okay. the world. So then, then I may have understood, uh, misunderstood you. This year, absolutely. I, I think they have to be in the conversation. To me, they're still in the conversation of one of the, the, the top teams in the in the world, right? This this, this doesn't stop that. Um, you know, there's, there's some conversations happening on, like, whether this upset is bigger than last year's upset Milano over Perugia. And personally, I don't think so. I don't think um, so either. For, for a few reasons. First and foremost, you don't have Spertoli, right? And if Rob, you and I chatted a little bit yesterday. If Trentino has Spertoli, this is a different series. It's a 3-0 um, series. What is, Trentino wins the series in three. I will die on that hill. Yeah. We'll never know. Uh, I I, I think maybe four. I think that if you look at the way the guns may uh, Moan wins that game three again, they make that switch up to, to put Lepke on the right side. Obviously, we can talk we can talk about that real quick, but or, or in a, in a little bit. But I agree. This is this is Trentino's series to 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 lose even more so if Spertoli is setting for them. Right. The big key in this one was having. The, the, block, the, the soft block touches for Monza, they were able to key in on Trentino's offense so much easier. When you look at Lavia and, and Nicoletto's stats uh, from this final game, they're not that good. Nicoletto, 15 for 48, right? Just Only not hitting. terminal enough. Just just not terminal. Same thing for, for Lavia. Both of them are hitting at 31 and 32% respectively. We're not even talking about efficiency right now. They had them shut down. And in like we're talking about a left side where you have a mismatch against Kachopa as well, right? That, that's, a, that's a massive mismatch, and they weren't able to, to take advantage of it. Lepke had no negative block touches whatsoever in this match. He had seven, no, no block stuffs, but seven, seven block touches. And DiMartino and Galassi were the same. They just slowed them down consistently and made digs. Digging was was the, the big things. Bringing in Lucky so that you can be dynamic and, and, and be able to play that way was was just phenomenal uh, for me. Ultimately, like it just seemed that after 45 days of of playing with Aquarone, it finally caught up to Trentino. Nailed right? it. It, it, yeah. it. It finally caught up to Trentino that Aquarone wasn't Spertoli. That he wasn't a, a top a, a top flight setter, and as soon as Monza made that change to bring in Lepke to have him on the right side, and I have to say, I don't care what Volleyball World says, I don't care what the weaves in the discourse said. You have to give the MVP of the series to either Mara Lepke. Lepke was the most offensively gifted player in this in this series. He had the most points. He had the highest efficiency for Monza. Mara was an absolute warrior. We saw the change that comes in. He comes back for game three. This thing's is blowed wide open. Yep. Over that time, over that time, Rob St. Clair, when you're looking at uh, the, the, the numbers and everyone's saying, oh, but Rain's a better passer than Mara. Rain's a better passer than this Mara. Not in this series. With more targets, Mar passed a two a two two point one five, ran past a one point nine six. And that's in with two less games. Ran played all five games in the series. Mar only played two or three. Mar only played three, right? So he's getting bombarded and he's passing better than ran. For me, when you when you look at where that mismatch is, I look defensively, I look at digs. Ran is a P2. He needs to play defense, and he he needs to serve receive, right? Clearly, they've they've marked that Mar is the better offensive threat, so they're going to put pressure on him, and they think he's the worst passer. Okay, too. Obviously, he was up to the task, but defensively is where things really shine. That Mar to me has to be the the MVP of this series. In three matches, Mar made thirty one digs on 37 touched balls he was averaging a dig percentage of 83.8 percent 
which is gnarly. That's way higher than Gagini. Gagini was a master, too. He dug 43 balls on 68. But you look at Rand's numbers. In five matches, he dug 21 balls. He dug half of the number of balls that, that Gagini did in the same amount of, of matches. You're a P2. You need to be going out there and, and balling out. Like that, that is your role. He makes one good one-handed dig, and everyone blows up. And yet Mar goes out and gets 17 digs in this matches in this match compared to, to Rand three. And everyone's just being like, well, Rand's a better defensive player. That's why he's winning the MVP. All right. Um, I, so, I've, but I've read that. that being that being said, I will I will say that this team doesn't win without Rand Takahashi. 100 percent Yeah, of course. He, he 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 brings this team together. But I was just so sick and tired of watching people in the discord being like oh rand's the mvp or watching volleyball this this post that you posted here was posted after congratulating ran to go going to the finals that was the priority for, for, for volleyball world and even japanese fans were in the chat of, or in the, the comments being like yo this is a little much and it was a little much and it always is a little much when it comes to volleyball world and japanese players all right I, I have some takes as well because this is uh, this is a series and a, and a result that needs to be talked about a lot. Um, you nailed it in saying that at the end of the day, Aquarone, who did not play badly, mm -hmm. but Aquarone is just not a top level setter. Uh, the 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 level of the, the level of block touch that Monza was able to get. They only stuff blocked seven balls in a five set match in game five, which isn't very much, but they slowed down so many balls and you can see it from Lavia and Micheletto's kill percentages just not even close to terminal enough and I think that was part of an overall shift oh, obviously there were several major changes that Monza made getting Steven Marr back from concussion for match three unbelievably important there is not definitely not a coincidence that Monza lost the two matches without Mar and won the three matches with him not a coincidence at all uh, the same of course goes for switching Eric Klepke to the opposite uh, created just the ability to touch more balls play a much more dynamic style and Eric deserves a lot of credit for just straight up ripping the ball on the right side dude his attack numbers in, in those three games were off the charts he was so good including in match 5 22 for 46 with only three errors playing out of position like that's just ridiculous but at the end of the day trentino we've talked about them before is their strength is kind of similar to the best versions of the italian national team like the one that won the world championship two years ago that trentino at their best is able to completely bend the match including their opponents to their pace and to their style of the game and with Aquarone setting and with this Monza team just mixing things up and being weird and being different, Trentino was unable to do that. Monza was extending rallies. They were digging balls. They were Their block coverage was amazing. Uh, and they the longer and sloppier rallies got, Trentino got even less terminal and more visibly uncomfortable to me. And Monza was just doing this weird stuff and throwing the ball high up in the air and hitting weird shots and throwing balls over with two hands and whatever it was, it, it, it worked for them. And the man, and I need to give tremendous credit to two people, two people that we have clowned on. Oh yeah. hundred percent. One this of those people, one of those people is John Luca Galassi because we make fun of him for uh, more, so more you than me. I make fun of him a lot for just loving serving the ball into the net so much. It's just his favorite thing to do. But um, he was the most actually dangerous server in the series for Monza. Yep. He was the guy that had the green light. And we've talked about before, there's no point in giving him anything but the green light because the result's going to be the same. But yep. um, his service pressure was a big deal. But um, he was a, a legitimate factor on offense too. 12 for 18 in game five. That's a lot of volume for a middle. Last but not least, in my opinion, the MVP of the series was Marco freaking Gagini. He was everywhere at the libero position. And we have clowned on him so much for being a total liability in serve reception, which at various points throughout the season he has been. If you're the libero and you're getting the guy, if you're the guy with the most targets, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it was a problem, but not in this series. He, uh, he was, I thought, above average on serve receive, but on defense and especially in block coverage, he was un believable the balls that he kept off the floor somehow some way uh Mo there's no way monza wins this series without marco gagini on defense and we have to give credit where it's due gagini leveled up for sure the, he he leveled up he outplayed lorenzano both on the eye test and, and the numbers prove it too. Pass better than, than Lorenzano. 
Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, and he does better than Lorizano. His defense is incredible. Uh, s- some of the best we've ever seen. Um, I actually agree with Dave Rogers calling him good genius because he was making, making <laughs> I love some, that call. He, he was making some good genius plays. Um, like I said, 43 digs uh, in this series. He has a dig percentage of, of 67.2, which is fantastic. He passed uh, a, a 2.01. Which is like fine, which, which is fine. which is ab- absolutely fine. But when you look at Lorenzano uh, on the other side of that, Lavin uh, Lorenzano only passed a one nine, right? And Lorenzano, when you look at defensively, Lorenzano only made thirty four dicks, right? So Gagini was absolutely massive all all match long, and you saw it too in the celebrations. Rand makes the kill. Mar goes to him, picks him up, gives him a hug, and they immediately go to stand over Gugini and to start start shaking him. Like you can tell that it was it was so important that someone I forget who it was uh, in Discord made the comparison of to like goalkeeper in soccer where Gugini oh, will, sure. will, 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 sure. will be so solid for so long, but they'll make one or two stupid, maybe like unfocused mistakes and it's just kind of like oh man and i absolutely relate to that because i was 100 percent that that goalie in soccer like i'd make a whole, a whole bunch of good plays and then let in a questionable one and my like confidence would go down and people would start chirping and you know it, it, it would go bad but he stepped up I, I i think that this was truly rob you said it uh, a little bit earlier about how monza was just throwing some weird stuff at them this to me was old school volleyball versus new school volleyball and the the old school in terms of trentino like they play like the right way but they don't play much of like 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 that tip and roll and that throw and that push and that two-hand volley over they don't play very very openly they play a very standard style of volleyball especially this this year with rich licky on the right side i mean we have to give Rich Licky his his credit. His oh dues. God, he was, he was automatic. He, he was automatic. Thirty one points in this one. He was the only Trentino player who truly showed up to play through and through. Actually, no, Kozo Kurs- Seven blocks for Kozo Yeah, Kozo was awesome. Ha- you 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 have to give give that to him as well. But it's a very traditional style that they play, and you saw especially in this match so many times where Lepke would do a, a set over, or Mar would would push it through. And there would be an emotional reaction on the Trentino side. Uh, there was one definitely where like Lepke put it down the line when he was he was on the left side, and Aquarone grabbed it. And he grabbed the ball, and it looked like he wanted to, like hit it, and like solely had to go over and be like, "Yo, chill, calm, t- calm down." It was they were not happy with the non calls of of the pushing and the tipping and stuff like that. Like, it's going to be interesting to see Trentino play against JW uh, in the Champions League because that They're is JW. That. That, they're gonna see that for they're, they're, and they're gonna see that and they were were getting frustrated so to me it was like trentino just never really changed up their game all, all that no, much they didn't and, I, and, I definitely think that that solely got out coached uh now again the limitation was that they were playing this whole thing with their backup setter we saw ricardo spiritually he was able to play a little bit in game five he only played the back row uh what i assume is going on there is that he's not able to block because yeah, no, the, his that, hand was still his yeah. hand was still hev- heavily taped. It, there's there's no way that they would chance that, you know. Definitely, and not. I mean, so so he would he, come. In, he came in the back row. He served. He set a couple balls that, but then went out. But like, I just think that Trentino was limited by the fact that they had a backup setter. There were also some that they definitely didn't deal well enough with the with Monza's fight back mentally. I don't think mm-hmm. Trentino expected Monza to get up off the mat after taking two punches in games one and two. I think Trentino kind of expected Monza just to lie down and die in front of them, the, the very much the way Modena did in the quarterfinal series. But that's not what happened at all, and I think Monza deserves tremendous credit for that. We got to talk about, though, about the consequences of this, and there are a few. One is, Everett, really quickly, do you think that Monza stands a chance against Perugia in the final? I mean, we didn't think they stood a chance against Trentino in the semis, right? Um, and maybe that was a little bit si- silly given that Trentino was, uh, Monza was one of the few teams to actually beat Trento this year. True. Like they beat them in, in, in the Super Cup. And like we, we've kind of seen this before. Um, I don't see why not. Mo- Monza is 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 riding a wave right now. Um and actually like on on that note I was was messaging with Mar uh after the game yesterday and he he said something that was like really poignant and I think kind of encapsulates the 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 vibe of this Monza team right now. He's like honestly 
is it's it's beautiful volleyball. Probably more happy about that than winning. I love seeing my friends made, and I love what we have made. Or sorry, I love seeing my friends win, and I love what we have made. Right. So you can awesome. tell that, that there was some type of internal conversation and and meeting within Monza and. And all, and you're, you're even seeing it on social with the way that they're, they're posting and, and stuff like that too. Like Monza is a fun team, and they're riding those those good waves right now, right? They were down 0-2 to the best team, argue argue the best team in the world, right? Before the series, we would have called called them the best team in the world. And not only do they come back and win it, but they do it by like completely switching it up, like throwing left key on the right side, completely. Like Schwartz was their top scorer. Like he still is their top scorer on the season. He still scored more more points than, than anyone else, and it's not something that they haven't done this season. But they were able to to change it up completely, and that just kind of shows that mindset that this Monza team is in right now. Um, but it's a huh. it's a magical run. Here's the thing: it is. But yeah, they have no chance against Perugia. Oh come on! No, you can't, you can't say they have no chance now after what I just I done. I will say that, and it's it's a bummer because this uh, I had such a good time watching Monza complete that comeback. It, it was it was beautiful to watch a team come together in that way, and that was like the what they built and what, what like exactly what Mar said, and he and he was at the absolute anchor of it all. That none of that happens without Stephen Mar, both. Uh, the the on court ability, but also like the emotional galvanization of that team. None of that happens without Stephen Mar. The problem with, against Perugia is that it's a horrendous matchup. It is such a bad matchup for Peru, for Monza. Perugia is a much better blocking team, I think, even than Trentino is. Uh, Perugia yes. is a terrifying exactly. blocking team. Perugia is the scariest serving team, I would say, on planet Earth. That is not as a strength of Monza's is fighting off servers like that. And uh, Monza won't be able to. Like if if they if they play this extended rally game and sloppy weird garbage against Perugia, that's okay. That's okay with Perugia. They're not going to get rattled in the same way that Trentino kind of did because they're just going to go up and continue to take the biggest rip at the ball that they can possibly muster. And that level of firepower and ability, seven players in and out, I, I don't particularly like the matchup for Monza. Uh, the the other problem is. Monza now has guaranteed themselves a spot in the CEV Champions League for next year. And I I hate talking about tra- mids transfers before the season's over. I think that it's the dumbest thing in sports. I hate that it happens in volleyball, but unfortunately we have to talk about it now. With well, Steven Mars with Steven Mars listen, with Steven Mar saying that it was such a beautiful thing that they put together and they it's such a such a magical run. This entire team is breaking apart. Is this going to be a good representation of Italy in the Champions League next year? I would argue no, not at all. Yeah. I I, I want to touch on your, on your first point first because I think at, at this point it's ridiculous to say that Monza has no chance. We th- did you think did you think Milano had a chance against Perugia? Last year? No. This year. Oh, this, this year? No, and they didn't. I said, oh, I said, no, absolutely not, and they lost. And we don't even need to talk about oh, match we, four. It was just a formality. Oh no, yeah, no, that that we're not we're 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 not even we're not even touching it. But no. <laughs> we did we did discuss early on in in these series. There was a point when after games one, where I was like, if Perugia goes up two nothing, it's still a toss up. Whereas the Trentino goes up two nothing, it won't be. And I mean that you were that's wrong what, about both. Yeah, we were we were absolutely wrong about both. But I think that like. I think that this is going to be a good series. I fully agree with you that this is a matchup, but like Monza, Monza has has surprised us already this season a, a few times, and they have that belief, and they also have different looks. I don't think we've seen the last of Schwartz, right? I, I think I think we're going to see him come back come, come back again, and it, it it it's it's going to be a bit of a battle. Yes, it's it's definitely going to be an uphill battle for sure, but like you can't you can't deny the magic of Monza. But oh, definitely not. The- I'm not denying it. However, like think about think about the matchup that they just played with Alessandro Aquarone setting. Now they're going to get Simone Ginelli. Yeah, I, I fully agree that the matchup isn't there. But like, <laughs> it's not hey. good. I hey, and I, they- I I hope that Monza does continue to pull it off because it has been magical, and I love magic like this in volleyball. Um, but it all I also don't like the fact that that like. I don't like the consequences of them winning this series because now I believe that they're going to put a bad product 
in the CV Championship next year. For, for sure. Like I and and this this to me, Rob, has to be brought into the overall conversation of what the fuck is volleyball doing where a transfer market happens during the season? It's How our best players most are being signed in November, right? It's it's absolutely brutal. It's it's it, it, it just shows how Bush League volleyball is on so many levels. And I need to do some asking and figuring out, like, why is this the case in volleyball that our transfer season is during the season? That we already know that Rand's going back to Japan next year. We already know that Mar's going to Piacenza. We already know that Lepke, Lepke is going to Lube. That just sucks so much. The fact that this team has come together and gone on this amazing run. I would love to see this team in, as it is right now in Champions League next year. Right as it is this right team, now, 100%. as it, as as it is right now, just take it, copy, move it on to a two year contract. Sure, I would absolutely love to see that, but we're not going to get that. We're not going to get that because volleyball sucks. Volleyball sucks, and our transfer season starts in November. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So I hate that too. <laughs> I think it's gonna. I I don't. I'm afraid of the team that Monza is going to be able to field for next season Champions League, but we have. We don't have to worry about that yet. We can certainly complain about that in the fall when it comes around. For now, we get, we get a final series that we get to watch, uh, Perugia against Monza. If I had to pick right now, I think it's Perugia 3-1 to one in matches, and that might even be generous. That might even I be would, generous. It starts, you know on, it starts on Thursday, by the way. It starts this Thursday, the 18th at 2.30 p.m. I'm, Eastern. I'm going Monza in five. <laughs> this sounds a little. This sounds. But just, ever, imagine, this, just, I just imagine got the vu. stories. Just oh, imagine yeah. the stories. I just got deja vu of of five. you and I of you and I standing on a, the court in Charleston, West Virginia, doing the pregame show at the North Seca Championship before the gold medal match when we were picking who was going to win that final between <laughs> the United States and Canada. That's I, fair. I no, said that. Screw you. That's I said that. Fair. I said that it was going to be United States three dong, and you you acted like you just got shot and you said absolutely not that's insulting how could you ever say that canada and five canada and five what happened Rob, remind I me i have to keep up my what happened. okay <laughs> okay people expect me to go believe about canada i have to keep it up so yes i'm saying moans in five mostly because this would be one of the be- this would be the best playoff run of all time it, yeah, it would it if, would. if, if monza pulls this off this would be the best playoff run of all time. Not only because of of them winning it, and, and that's tough. Like this isn't the NBA, this isn't the NHL, where like or the NFL, where like random seeds happen in, in the playoffs. There's that much parity. Like this is volleyball. The top there's the top four for a reason, you know. And we see that consistently because they can but buy the best players. Able... There's no salary cap. It should just it, it creates playoffs that are set up to be chalk. And when when but it's not if, chalk, it's amazing. Yeah, but if they are able to beat Lube. Trentino and Perugia, the three powers of the last however many years, that would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, it would. So, it would. so, you know, once again, congrats to Monza. Stephen Marr is the man. Eric Lepke is the man. Ran Takahashi is phenomenal. That entire team is just a lot of fun to watch. They play such a free flowing, fun, dynamic style of volleyball that reminds me a lot of Trentino last year. To be honest, mm. when they had Matej Kaczynski and they were able to, to, to was that yeah, last year or two years ago? That was, that was last no, year. Last year. That was mm-hmm. last year. Yeah. Um, we just watched so much volleyball, Rob. I can't, I can't keep track <laughs> of it all. Um, right. Like it, it, it reminded me a lot of that, but Kachopa, like for all his faults, he's just so fun and, and freeing and it's, it's, it's great. So, yeah. So congratulations again to Monza uh, Trentino. I think we can. Uh, wait till like next week's show to talk a little bit more about the impact of losing this and on what their prospects are to go win the CV Champions League because honestly I still like them especially now that they're getting Ricardo Spiritually back but we can save that for next week from one Vero Volley crowning achievement on the other side we have an incredibly disappointing and there's no other way to say it but a yeah. choke of all chokes the Malonza women were six donged by Scandici in the Lega Volley Feminile semifinals. Six and O oh, Scandici goes and sets to reach the final. They'll take on Caneliano. We can talk about that series in a minute. But while we're talking about the Vero Volley Club, uh, Malonza in this case on the women's side, what the hell was this team doing? 
what on earth sort of a showing was this? Failing to even take a set? You're going to go play for a Champions League. You can't even take a set against Scandici? What are uh, who is worse than you be in the Italian format because of the foreigner limit issues that they have? What are we talking about here? I don't I don't, I don't really have that much to add. Like that was it was just so out of I mean, okay. I, there's two sides to this. First and foremost, Zhu Ting came to ball. She did. She was and awesome. that 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 has has to be said that that Zhu Ting came to ball and when with with the the rest of this team and and how they play, when Zhu comes to ball, it just adds such a dynamic uh, experience going on. This also adds another spicy layer to what is becoming. I don't know if it's a rivalry. But I feel like there has to be some tension right now between Agonu and Antropova. Antropova. Right. Mm. Because these these like like once again, like that's the reason that right? That that's that's the reason that she wasn't necessarily playing. That's the reason why uh Mazanti wasn't playing Agonu because he liked Antrop- Antropova better. And Antropova goes out and honestly kind of outplays Paolo Agonu. Scores as much as her was more efficient than than her. Like ha- had a good all around game, more blocks, more aces. Like, and that that's it's it's once again like we've talked about it all the time with this Malona M- Malonza club, and it seems to be very differently run on the women's side than than on the men's side. But it's just a jumble of good players with no actual chemistry. Um, and they, they, they just don't seem to be able to pull it, pull it together. Um, and unfortunately and as, as Dom thing, that's the thing is that I've, I've thought the same thing. I've, I've, I've been a hundred percent with you about this Malenza team for the past, like really two, three years since they've become one of the higher budget teams in Lega Valley Feminile. Mm-hmm. They, they've been frustrating to watch because of these reasons, but then they went out and they won that Fenerbahce series in champions league. And that, the fact that they that that didn't fix them that that didn't like that they didn't like remember what it felt like to win that series they didn't like have any amount of pride to to try and turn this thing around like yes alessia oro is playing on one and a half ankles obviously that has to be said she is not 100 percent. that is a That's fact a thing. Yeah. it is a big thing and their backup setter I, I i forget her name was she's so bad i think vittoria prandi is her name yeah I watching her wa- watching her set in the quarterfinals was rough it was not good. So Oro was not 100% for sure, but like the the body language was awful. The the style of play, the timing of these terrible sloppy errors. I mean, the the outside hitter position in the second match was it was a joke. Like Helena Kazot went 1 for 8 with six errors. Uh Miriam Silla was not much better. Kara Bajima off the bench was terrible, like 0 for 3 with an error, like they, other than Egonu, who did what she could, although she made a few too many errors in both matches, and then Rafaela Foley, who I think was their second best player overall. Uh, Malonza had nothing; they had nothing at all, and nothing. they didn't. They did, whatever strings that they were able to be pulled, uh, Massimo Kelly didn't even bother, and I, I, I don't really understand. What they well, n- none of it makes sense to me. N- none of the strategy around any of it. None of the. I, I I don't get it. I don't get any of it. And now they're gonna they're in the same position as Trentino is. They're gonna play for third. Uh, they better win that series over Novara. Otherwise, they're not even playing Champions League next year. But then they still somehow have a chance to go win a Champions League final in a one match situation. I'm now I definitely wouldn't pick them. I wouldn't pick them to have much of a chance against Camiliano in that format. No, I mean whereas Trentino, I mean this this is two very similar situations where you have an injured setter who have downed a very, very good team in the semifinals and they will both be going to the champions league finals. And there, there's question marks around it. I, it's a toss up for me between JW and Trentino. It's not a toss up for me between Milano and Canigliano. Oh, no, it's, not not a, it's not a toss up for me between Canigliano and absolutely anyone. The fact that Novaro won a game in the series, like, like, I, th- I think that's as rare as like me pooping my pants, you know, like <laughs> it, like it just doesn't happen like once in, once in a blue moon. So yeah, like uh, I think that, that 
that this Champions League final on the women's side is one sided. I mean, I'm not going to say that because it does have the potential. We're, we're going to preview it, of course, here. But Paolo Gono is still Paolo Gono. Right. And she has that ability to flip on that switch. But that problem is, is that flip, f- switch can also be flipped off. And it was very clear that if she wasn't completely on in this series, there wasn't enough happening around her. And like when I look at this Milano team and, and it's how it's built, and especially the, the downsides that they have on the left side, like it reminds me a lot of Zasha Basha. Uh, mm. with, and, and watching them where you have so much pressure on Bolkovic to do so much. And it doesn't matter. Like sometimes they get a good Alexa Gray match. Sometimes they get a good Hunter Balladin match. Sometimes they get a, a good Vronkova match. It's the same thing with this uh, Milano team. Sometimes you get a Mer- good Miriam Silla. Sometimes you get a good Car- Carabayama. Sometimes you get a good uh, Helena Kazot. Um, one big thing, though, about this team in Champions League versus like the League of Volley Femininity, of course, is the, the foreigner rule, right? Because right. ideally you have Miriam Silla coming off the bench, right? They won't in do my, that, I, what? but I agree I know they you. don't. <laughs> I know they don't, right? But ideally you would have um, uh, Bayama and, and Kezo start. Well, uh, after their last performances, I don't even know what you do at that position. Uh, I made two mistakes I need to correct. One, I said Akeli, he coaches the Moans of Men, my fault. I'm talking about Gaspari. He coaches the women, he's clueless. And then also somebody in the chat says that uh, they don't play a third place series in the League of Volley Feminile. Just goes to Monza, who's the higher seed, the Malonza, who's the higher seeded team from the regular season, which I love. I think that's fantastic. Great. Like, I think third place series are meaningless. And I love that. So good for the Lega Volley Feminile. I'm, I'm a big fan of that format. Um, ah. I like it. I, we do have to I, talk I, about the fact that, that Corneliano did lose a match. You mentioned it. Uh, there was, it was notable because although they went down 2-0, looked terrible, brought it back to the fifth against Novara, they did end up losing. That was the first match Corneliano has lost this season mm-hmm. in any format, in any tournament, in any place. The first match they've lost this season. <laughs> And, and that's why it doesn't worry me. Right. It doesn't worry me I, at all. And that's why I think it's a good thing. Because right? everybody on the planet knew that they were going to three Dong Novara in match three. And they did. Yeah. Everyone knew yeah. that they were going to respond from that. And they did. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, Marina Markova in game two, though, 26 points. Yeah, she was really good. Five with a block and three aces. It just continues that, that like, what does Russia look like right now? It's so, like, they're so far removed from international play. But, like, how, like. It, it it just it just goes on uh so so much further. Um I didn't I Corneliano, I, by the way, Corneliano hit fifty eight percent kills as a team in the in the in the third match. Even, <laughs> Absolute joke. Uh Ella, Isabel Hawk eighteen for twenty seven. <laughs> oh, so predictable that they were gonna dominate that third game. Very, very predictable. And anyway, sorry, yeah. anyway. Um, I I lost my my train of thought to be honest. I I, I don't so really, really uh, talking about much. I was finally, we get we finally get a best of five series in the final, which is finally. cool because last year Caneliano was similarly untouchable, but Malonza last year gave him a hell of a series. He did. They and did. Um, ever do you think that Scandici can do the same? No, I agree. I would love for them to do the same, and I and I will be watching the series as much as I can now that I'm employed again. Uh, Watching volleyball becomes a lot harder, um, but you know what? If 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 like all of Scandici needs to show up, right? All and and that's that's going to be the the big thing. Like Herbots wasn't really present that much in game number uh, in game number two uh, for them. Like I think she only had like six or six or, or something points. It, 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 it wasn't all that all that much. Um, but Scandici is going to need to be able to do two things, and, and that's exert massive amounts of pressure on Canigliano. And number two, and that's weather the storm from Canigliano, right? And because Canigliano is just nonstop. Um, who's, who's coaching Scandici again? Is it still uh, Barbellini, right? Barbellini. Yeah, he's shipping off to League One in the States next season. <laughs> I yeah, just don't. That... There's just no one who's able to run with uh, Santarelli. Um, no chance. Santarelli right now. No it's not, chance. Not even. Not even close. So yeah, like me. I, I, yeah, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. When when does this? I I know the men get started on Thursday. 
the women are Wednesday, Wednesday, 2 30 PM Eastern. Okay. Uh, yeah. The position for position, I would pick every single one of Corneliano's players, except maybe peak Juting or peak Brit Herbots. Yeah. But we haven't seen either of those two players be peak at the yeah, same that's, time. That's a big, season. right. Big right? if. Uh, Joanna Volos is going to run circles around Maya Onyanovic. So, yeah. uh, Corneliano is way better in the middle. They're way better at libero. I think Hawk is way better than Antropova. And uh, Robinson and Plummer have a nice, a good like yin-yang, different style thing going. And they're both playing with a lot of confidence and executing at a high level. Um, they've if, been, and, they've if been Scandici really fantastic. Won- Season. They have. They, they have, they've both been really good in the playoffs too, especially yeah. like Plummer's reception is always a question and Kelsey Robinson's ability to terminate. And they've both been doing that. Um, if Scandici won a match in this final, I'd be surprised. I'd be happy because I would like a little bit of drama, but I would be surprised. Yeah, I kind of agree. It's it, 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 it'll be interesting. But then again, I didn't think Scandici, like I thought it was going to be a two dong for, for Malonza in the semifinal series, right? So once again, like Scandici has impressed us before and surprised us before. So sure. it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's a toss up, but I can see Scandici maybe taking one. Novara took one. I don't see why Scandici can't. True. Good point. So. All right. Uh, that is it for Italy. Before we move on to a whole lot more playoff volleyball, a couple things we got to talk about. Hey, Everett, where'd you get that t shirt? Oh, you know, just that volleyballstore.com where you can use the code SPICY to get 15% off of your entire or you get the 9 by 9 series. You get some classic volleyball sort of stuff, some spicy volleyball stuff. And, of course, the proud owner of our favorite segment, the Where's Daddy series. Uh, where was Daddy last week, Rob St. Clair? Daddy Stankovic, as he is hidden somewhere in every single one of our shows, Last week, he found his way onto a new team, as he very much likes to do. He was celebrating Monza's Game 3 win, and somebody in the Discord, I think it was our Italian friend Leggio Drolo, uh, was like, I was, he was like, oh, I was looking through that Monza team photo and wondering why Arthur Schwartz wasn't in there, and then I realized. <laughs> it's Daddy. You see him up there at the top of the screen ne- next to super-duper bald Galassi. There he is. So Daddy was hanging out with Monza this past week. Uh, well, yeah, Daddy's hidden somewhere in every episode. Make sure you keep an eye out for him, and when you find him, you wait until the show is over, until after the live stream is over, and then you comment the timestamp of where Daddy is in the main YouTube comment section. Donde está el papá? I was laughing at that too. That's <laughs> awesome from that <Matt> both. <laughs> Donde está el papá? El padre. Where's yeah. Daddy in Espanol? Um, yeah, yeah, Daddy's Padre would be better than Papa. Eh? Daddy's somewhere. Make sure you find him and uh, wait till the end of the show and comment in the main YouTube comment section. Timestamp where he is, and uh, you'll get a shout out next week. Speaking of a shout out, let's see who was the first one to find him. Brody Cox last week said, "Daddy keeping Monza alive at 34 minutes." And uh, Anthony Lee said, "Schwartz did so badly that he got replaced by Daddy." Uh oh. <laughs> Both great. I will. I, I will point out that in game number two, that Schwartz was statistically Schwartz's worst game. Um, he still had a better efficiency than Rantak Ashi. Ooh, <laughs> All right, let's move on uh, because we need to talk about the Plus Liga. Uh, they have been full speed ahead with the Plus Liga playoffs. I think, yeah, we we missed. Both matches already didn't miss, but we, uh, we haven't covered any of the playoffs yet because on last week's show, we were just saying that the playoff field was set. It was a two-match home-and-away series with golden set potential. Uh, Everett, you and I both picked Chalk, and Chalk is exactly what happened. Uh, JSW will take on Rosovia. Xavier Che will take on Vershava in the semis, but it wasn't without its drama. There was no, a little bit of spiciness in these Polish quarterfinals. Rob, I... I will be completely honest. I did not watch any of these Polish quarterfinals. They were on at times when I was not around. And I can't watch them back on demand. And I can't watch them on volumetrics. However, when I saw that Lublin was up 3 nothing on... Like, like first they were up 2 nothing and then leading in the third on Vorshava. I was like, what's going on? And so uh, originally, because I was just watching on, on sports or flash score, it just said like Lublin... 4-3 on Dude, aggregate. I, I saw the same thing. And didn't show that there was a golden set going yeah. on. Yeah. So I was was this Friday. It was Saturday or um I don't Friday remember. Or Sunday. No, it was Sunday. 
Yeah, it was Sunday. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was Sunday. It was, so I, was, I was I was on my way to coaching or I coaching. Can't really remember. And and I I was watching it. There was for a, a a split second before I was able to open the Discord that I thought that Lublin had gone through over Warsaw because of a three dong and because that the the tiebreaker was sets one and versus lost. Like yeah, I knew it was a golden set, but it, yeah, I was looking at the same thing. I, a golden set didn't show up until. Like I had to like dig and find it. It was probably while the golden set was still going on. But yeah, um, sure enough, the Plus Liga switches their playoff format, and in the first possible chance, you get a golden set, and Vershava survives somehow. And uh, although they got three dong by Luke Lublin, uh, they did win the golden set, fifteen to twelve. So uh, Vershava moves through. Uh, man, I kind of feel bad for Lublin because they were playing awesome. Like, let's see, what were the splits? Twenty, twenty-two, and nineteen. Like they controlled the the actual portion of the match. But then, yeah. Uh, yeah, in the golden set, let me see what what, what happened in the actual golden set. Um, man, not a whole lot of high man, not a lot of high scoring. Maybe it was just a lot of no. Lublin errors. Yeah, yeah, some Lublin errors, and and from what I saw, Rashava just kind of spread out the uh, the uh, the offense. Yeah, looks like it. So yeah, yeah. definitely some drama, and uh, that's fun. I like the drama. But at the same time, I think the right four teams made it to the quarter to the semis because these two semifinal series are going to be sick. Like JSW versus Warsaw is a fun series. Now the problem is, um, speaking about Rosovia, they got past Treffel Gdansk like relatively no problem. Um, but they, but <laughs> but big there's but a big, there's a big but there's a there big is. but come. and that is the oh, fact God. that Stefan Boyer, their starting opposite, is out for the season. Yout. I think yeah, that, that this is. Was, I think that this was an injury that he suffered in practice. I'm not sure. Maybe it was in the first leg, but like in the second leg, he didn't even play. Or no, it it, it must have been the first leg because I'm looking at it. The the first leg, Rosovia won in five. Uh, Boye started the first two sets and then had to go to the bench. Somebody let us know in the chat what. Uh, oh, maybe Luke said maybe ankle roll. That that would definitely track. <laughs> I'm, but, um, I'm seeing the chat. They're saying that he will not be back. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. I think I think the club even posted about that, saying that um, maybe it was just a little bit of a brash reaction to one of their starters going down. But Rosovia on Instagram kind of went on a bit of a rant from their club's Instagram account, saying we knew this would be a problem at the beginning of the season. We played way too many games. There's way too much wear and tear on the athletes. Uh, we we alerted the federation that this was going to be a problem. Nobody said anything, and now one of our best players got hurt. I understand their concerns because it is way too much volleyball. It is way too much wear and tear on the athletes, but I also think it's a, a little bit reactive. Yeah. However, they're still going to go to the semifinal with a half-decent chance because a heroic, heroic effort off the bench by their backup opposite, Jakub Butsky, doing something that I've almost never seen before, 11 aces in one match 11 aces and only one service error Butsky 11 is, aces in four sets to Butsky's bury Gdansk. Butsky is 36 wow he's an 88 11 aces in one match for one player that's gross. Rosovia's ace to error ratio as a team was 18 aces to 19 errors. <laughs> that is, is disgusting. how is that how is that not clipped out? How have I not seen that on socials? How come someone in the Discord Discord posted all 11 aces back to back? Yeah, yeah that, that has to be done. And uh, 34 service attempts, like double the the next highest player on his team. So, so serving serving attempts is, in my opinion, actually an important important good step. step. Very much right. So. If you have a lot of serving attempts, that means you're going back and putting on a lot of pressure. I would love, like, back when I was like coaching and stuff like that, like, I would always, when we're especially at the, like you know, your college level, we'd be statting how well the other team passed on our serves. Like, I'd love to see that kind of stats as well. Um, volumetrics is good, but it's not, it's not that good. Um, but yeah, 11 aces is absolutely filthy, amazing, like that. That is gross. Like, if someone goes back there, he was 11 aces, 34 attempts. That <laughs> is crazy. I'm like trying to wrap my head around that, to be perfectly honest. I don't think I've ever seen a stat line like that. I don't think ever. I've ever seen double digit aces. And double and, digit aces is impressive. Absolutely. But only but one service one, error? <laughs> one error, and he had 34 attempts? That's crazy. Crazy. 
Chuck okay, has good. 13 They're... aces. Of course, Ronnie comes in with with any chance he can to pr- to say that we're wrong. Ronnie, Ronnie shut in. your mouth. Although I will say, I did threaten to, uh, to like kick Ronnie out of the Discord yesterday because he was just being <laughs> annoying. But I will say, I much I I I prefer I love arguing with Ronnie because he always has, at least if he doesn't have like stats based comebacks, he has funny comebacks. Not just like when you're arguing with someone. It's like, well, because Copa doesn't like him, and that's why he doesn't set him. <laughs> oh, ever you've been oh. having a field day in the volleyball source Discord, huh? <laughs> can we can we address one thing? And this will be completely off topic. Um, okay. At one point, I was going back and forth with some in the Discord, and someone else popped in and was just like, "You, it's stupid that you're arguing with an admin like that." And while I appreciate the sentiment and that. You know, you were on my side. I want you to be on my side because you believe what I'm saying. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, then tell me otherwise. Like you, oh, if, yeah. if you're a part of the Discord, you have full right to go after me. At, me too. At any point. Me right. too. Like, like, it, like we are no, and like I, I, I know I don't. I'm, I'm speaking for you as well because like we're no different than anyone else in the Discord. Right. You can tell us that you think we're wrong. You can tell us that you that, that you think you're stupid. There's plenty of times that people have like I've said something and people have said something back and it's changed how I've looked at things or changed how I thought of things. So I wanted to spell that like that that notion whatsoever that like if you're a part of the discord and you don't agree with what I'm saying or you, you, you know, like whatever it is, like tell me like if you want to oh, yeah, say there's... I'm stupid, like you want to go after me, you want to call me names like 100 percent. Go like, for it. You, we are fair game just as much as anyone else. Yep, there is no imbalance of power in the volleyball source Discord. Another reason nope. you all should join it. There's a link in the description. Um, yeah, come at me as well if you think I'm an idiot. Go for it. Unless, uh, unless you want to come at me about one topic that none of you know any anything about. If it's this topic that none of you know anything about, then uh, I'm I'm not super willing to hear those debates. But um, other than that, yeah, p- please. It, 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 Tell me, I'm an idiot. Ball, by all means, you're, because you're just in the position to shut them down in that in, in that point, right? That's like I was having a few, I was having a field day yesterday. It was, <laughs> it felt good because like I spent a lot of time getting a lot of flack. Like any time a Canadian player is like somewhat average, then I like I have to hear about it. So like in a in the time like this, like oh, I was giving it. I'm I'm already loading up my my ammunition against the fans of the Italian national team for this summer because uh, I've already seen people recently talking about Italians talking about how VNL doesn't matter and I'm I'm ready to jump down their throats about that stupid take. Anyway, um, back to the Plus Liga. These two series weren't very dramatic. JSW no. took care of Olsten two zero, uh, whatever. Xavier Che did take care of Stalnissa, but I do give Stalnissa a lot of credit for fighting pretty hard. They went up 2-0 in leg two um, before Xavier Che put together a reverse sweep. Now, after they, after they took two sets, it was over, so the fifth set was meaningless. Uh, but credit to Nissa for putting some effort in there. However, I, if they had won this series, I would have quit everything related to volleyball because it would have made me watch more of Matsuya Muzai and his stupid haircut. Oh, my God, it is so bad. Not only do I hate him as a player, his hair might be the worst thing I've ever seen. So thanks for participating. Good luck in the placement playoffs. Uh, I'm very excited about these semifinals. I think both of these series are going to be awesome, and I wish that they were longer. I wish they were longer than just two games. That's, I I I fully, because especially with what we've been seeing in the Super Lego, where we get to like sink our teeth into a series, and you have that adjustment and that change and that back and forth. Now, I, I understand why they're doing it for the Plus they've League. played way too many regular because, season games. But this is this is this is already fixed, right? Like they're they're already they've already made the changes in the future, and like we just have to wait for it to to, to be there. So that's why I think that like Rosovia whining about the fact that like yeah, boy, you got injured. Like maybe you should have played Butsky some more throughout the season. You know, like 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 whatever. Like it's every, everyone has to deal with it. Um, but yeah, you think you do you see Zaxa the whole season complaining about about injuries? So you think you see them like trying to complain up to the the league office about how long the season is when all their starters got hurt and missed games? Like yeah, get out of here. No, um, exactly. So, so uh, well, the, the semis do start on Wednesday. Uh, they're at decent times on Wednesday, and then leg two is on both on Saturday. So this time next week on next week's show, we will know the finalists in the Blue Liga, which is too fast. It is too it's fast. Too, it's too fucking fast, right? Like it. it blinked and the quarterfinals were done um 
it's one of my it's one of my few faults with the Plus Liga. Um, so when when do we is Schroda Saturday? Uh, so Sunday. it's Wednesday. The 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 yeah. first legs are Wednesday. The second legs are Saturday. Way off. Way off. <laughs> Just read the dates some... there, homie. <laughs> anyway, well, I, uh, I, I don't even know what date today is. Okay. I like Xavier. It's a good thing it's on the bottom of the screen. I like Xavier Chain JSW. <laughs> Uh, I've liked Xavier Che all season. I'm sticking with it. I think that team's really good. Uh, JSW, Our, I, do, I do like JSW over Rosovia without Boyer. That is yeah, a bummer. 100%. Unless um, Uwe Butsky decides to serve 11 more aces. And somehow. That could, if Butsky can throw down 11 aces and 11 kills again, like sick. What a performance. If he can, if he can serve 34 times in a match, like. Yeah, that's like, nuts. He served. For almost half the match, that's crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, Peter in the chat. Make sure you put in the Discord that video, the pulse that video of all eleven aces. I want to go see that because yeah, yeah. I, I remember, I remember Leon the match he had in the bubble in Rimini and VNL when he had thirteen Rimini. against Serbia, and uh, but he had and, five errors. Yeah, yeah, he had more errors, and it, it, I mean, it was a random VNL game that didn't matter all that much. This was a playoff game, like with 11 aces with the season on the line amazing uh all right anything else about the plus liga no just stoked to stoke to watch um the semifinals on wednesday Should me be too let's talk about turkey a it is the dead middle of the finals in both the men's and women's finals in turkey a uh, best of five series on both sides earlier today we had match number three between Fenerbahce and Adzajabasha, which has been a very good series. Fenerbahce won the first leg at home three to one. Adzajabasha stole the second leg at home three to two. But today uh, was a pretty convincing three dong by Fenerbahce. Pretty convincing. It was dominant. It pretty was dominant. convincing. Uh, my MVP had to be Etta Eridum. Absolutely. She was, without she was, fan- she was fantastic. 19 for a middle in three sets. It's outrageous. Yeah. 13 for 18 two blocks and and, and two aces um it, this one was 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 good I actually uh was able I was off work today and I was able to watch this one uh uh while, while having some lunch it was it was an, I wasn't gonna say it was it was a good match it was a dominant it was one side for, yep. for for Fenerbahce um it really seemed like they were just feeding Ada. Like it, they really wanted to put her on a pedestal. I mean, of course, Vargas was really good too. She was eighteen for twenty-eight, um, with a with a block and an ace uh, as well. On the other side, Boskovic, once again, like like just like I said, like Boskovic was pretty good. Like fifteen for thirty-five, like, not outstanding numbers. She scored seventeen, but then they just can't figure it out on the left side. Hande Baladin was their best one on the left side. She passed thirty-three percent po- or thirty-three percent positive seven percent perfect which would look great. at zajabash's passing numbers as a team oh 11 percent positive 30 or perfect 37 percent uh positive. gross like that, is, that is just it is ever just and i'm sorry to say this oh yeah alexa gray needs to spend the rest of the season on the bench well i mean get, she get was out kind of, of the reason get, they won the last game get her ready right? for na- like, get that, her ready for national team season i can't watch her pass anymore i can't do it it's, it's watch weird because anymore. she like sometimes she's good, like sometimes she's solid, and then other times she's just not there. Um, which like thankfully we don't really see on the Canadian national team all that much with her, but it's like been a consistent thing, um, especially in the in the past two seasons. But like, like she was basically the reason that they won game number game number two. Um, she came in off the bench and scored seventeen for them. Pass decent, forty-seven percent positive is is decent. That's fine, right? Which which, which is is fine, exactly. Um, but it just yeah, she was just, good on offense. Fair enough. Yeah, she was great on offense. Fifteen for fifteen twenty-four. It's almost kind of like the final game for Canadian last year, where she was absolutely automatic. But it's that consistency that that isn't there, um, and your, it has been frustrated. Your comparison from Adzajabasha to Malonza was spot on. Yeah, spot on with the the lack of outside hitter consistency and just the way that it feels to watch them. The way that it feels to watch Malonza and Adzajabasha is very similar. And and I don't really mean that in a good way. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean. 
I've had enough of Burkai complaining about Alexa when Hondi Baladine is just as bad. So yeah, it, she sucks too. She, she sucks. Just, about? Yeah, she sucks just as bad. So so um, game four is Thursday, uh, eleven a.m. Eastern. I would be surprised if Fenerbahce did not win that match and and win the title. That's that's yeah. what I expect. Fenerbahce is better. Uh, I think that Vargas is better than Boscovic straight up. It's close, but she's better. And Fedorovseva is so much better than any, than anybody else on Adzajabash's roster that uh, I'd be surpri- kind of surprised they didn't run away with it. One more shout out though to Ada Erdem for being a, a living legend and dropping 19 in, as a middle in a three set match. Yep, <laughs> that's some that, special that, stuff. That that is uh, it, it was pretty special. Like it almost surprised me because I know that she's been injured of late, and I like turned it on. And I was like, oh, Ada Erdem, nice. She's going off. And then it just seemed like every time I was looking up, she was scoring again. Um, and lo- love love to see that. She's like you've you've talked about it before, Rob, about how she's like the emotional leader on that team. And when they don't have her, they they struggle a little bit. Like definitely and yeah, against, against noticed, Alonso. Right, exactly. Uh, one more thing about the Turkish Women's League. Uh, congratulations to Vakif Bank. They very predictably won the third place series against THY. Vakif Bank will play Champions League next year. But it's the end of an era. It is the end of Gabi Guimara's time playing outside hitter for Vakif Bank. She's been there for five years, has won at least two Champions Leagues, has won every trophy there is to win in Turkey and the World Club Championship. And her career there has been all-time great. She really has had a phenomenal five seasons. This year didn't go their way because of their roster construction, like we've talked about a lot. But uh, I wanted to pay Tremendous respects to Gabi's career at Vakif Bank. She's one of their all-time best players and uh, is still my pick for best outside hitter in the world. So she posted like a long, pretty emotional thing on Instagram saying goodbye to the club. And it was just cool to see. It was cool to see a player have that level of impact for one club over a long time and win a bunch of tournaments. And uh, I just have a huge amount of respect for her. So congrats to Gabi and good luck on uh, wherever she goes next. We know where she goes next, but uh, we can leave that for next season. Where is she going? Just tell me. She's going to Canaliano, dude. <laughs> oh yeah, I knew, I knew that. And it's going to be Kira Van Rijk time at Vakif Bank, so that that's going to be interesting. Be I mean, upgrade, but still will be uh, difficult for them to break through past third where they yeah. are right now. I mean, when you when you look at Gabi, I think that Gabi's Gabi's time on Vakif Bank for me solidified her as one of the top outsides in the world. I don't, I wouldn't call her the top outside in the world now. I think over the past two seasons, she hasn't necessarily been um, the, the greatest, but like she did win two straight Champions League titles uh, with this team. And I would say that, like especially that that 2022 Champions League title, that was because of her. Like she was the leader on that team, and, and she was the one that that pushed them forward. So, um, and once again, like this is why you see. Like this is why Vakuf Bank is a good club because they keep players for long time, long periods yeah, of time. Vakuf Bank is a great, great, great club. Absolutely, yes. Lots, lots yeah, of Gabi, Gabi did win two Champions Leagues in a row, uh, in second in twenty one. Champions League wasn't played in twenty, so yeah, she she got to play in four Champions Leagues and took two firsts, a second, and a third. Yeah, that's not bad. That's pretty good. And fifth yeah. this year. Uh, pretty darn good. Uh, she is awesome, and I have a lot of respect for her. So good for her, and uh, we'll we'll probably be talking about Fenerbahce winning the league on next week's show. Speaking and of which, sorry, she she also won two club world championships. Yeah, she won one of those, right? Yeah, twenty uh, or nine, nineteen and uh, twenty two. Yeah, first year and, and took second last year. Yeah, and second this year. That's right. Yeah, they lost to Zajabash in the final this year. The tournament's so pointless. Uh, all right. Speaking of teams that are going to win the Turkish League this week, uh, Halkbank Ankara is up two to zero in the final series on Fenerbahce. We don't know that. Yes, yes. We do. Yeah. yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. They've both been three to one. I think Fenerbahce has put up a nice fight. I mean, them beating Zirat Bank in the semis was a hell of a story. They don't have the horses to run with Hawk Bank. They, they, they just don't. And that's no, okay. They don't. Nothing to be ashamed of. Finishing I mean, second is awesome. They're going to play Champions League next year. Yeah. I mean, they have no chance. They, hopefully, they're going to be picking up some good players. But I mean, realistically, it was like Zero Bank messed up. Like Zero For Bank sure. fucked up by, by not beating Fenerbahce sure. um, in that. I mean, yeah. I mean, a, a roster, a roster of Drazen Bridge and Dick Coy just doesn't get me going. Like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not even getting a half chub for that one. Like, oh. 
that so it's it, it it's not even good. I mean, Lou not Grinch even half not for bad. a guy named Dick. Come on, <laughs> come on. No, um, thirteen for twenty eight <laughs> just doesn't doesn't get me going. I mean, Lubridge was pretty good. He was twenty five for for thirty seven in this one with an ace. Lubridge is a, a good block. player, dude. There was a like I remember when he was playing on locomotive and we thought he was the answer to Serbia's right side. He was, and then he was hurt the whole summer, and Serbia is a dumpster fire anyway that doesn't deserve to go to the Olympics. But that's another conversation. Congrats in advance to Hawkbank. They're gonna win. And I'm if uh let's see, whatever what should I have to do if Hawkbank fails to win this series? I think I, I should I should have some I should have something on the line with how confident I am about the oh. Wins. You have to streak around TD place. <laughs> yeah, and get my credential taken away for the rest of time. Uh, actually, I have I have a thing that I have a thing that I can do. Uh, I have a thing. I've been sitting on this for a little while, and I have a thing that we need to use as a punishment. I have a thing that we need to use as a punishment, and I'm, I actually I think now is the time. I think now is the time to bring it out. One second. What I I honestly have this was not prepared. This was not discussed. I have no idea what's happening. Um, so this is this, what did yeah, you this, grab? This, this is, this is spur of the moment. This is spur of the moment. I've been if waiting. You, if you, if you suggest sodomy, I'm out. <laughs> Whoa, relax. Sorry. I've been waiting for the chance to use this. One this second. I'm scared. Like. <laughs> this is a blue high Q tank top. Did like one of your buddies make that? Yes, like, in the and shop, in the back it, of a shop somewhere. And gave it to me as a joke because he knows how I feel about that stupid. Like animal. Hinata, Hinata doesn't even have a face. This is a blue high Q tank top. If Hulkbank Ankara loses this playoff series, I will wear this uh, at the very least on next week's show. But uh, I'll probably have to wear it during VNL as well. So. Uh, if, yeah, if, no. If you if you get this wrong, you need to wear this like one of the days at VNL. I think that's and, fair. and remember it's cold in TD place and you will have to wear a tank top. You will be nipped. Yep. Yep. That's so. Uh, that's what's on the line. We're finally uh, we're whipping out the the prank high Q tank top as a punishment. So please, Hawk Bank, Mike Amaa, if you're watching, please win that series. All right. Uh, let's see what is next. Germany. Germany. Uh, the Bundesliga finals are set. There was actually a match today, and it was good, and it was free on sponsor on Twitch. Oh no, that was today. It oh, was. I'm so mad I missed that. Oh. Yeah, I watched it. It was a good match. So uh oh, Friedrichs Friedrichshafen beat Gießen in five. They won match five in the semifinal, I think three to one. And then Friedrichshafen beat Berlin in five today in match one of the final. It was good. Won. I'm just playing the stats right now. Friedrichshafen won it in five. Twenty-five uh, points for Michael Superlack. What? Yeah, Superlack is a baller. Maso had 15. Oh, I'm not going to hear the end of it from. Yeah, Ronnie. look at look at Ronnie Q and Spike. He's already ripping in the chat. Now I will I will have to give Maso credit. If you haven't seen this guy yet, just how physically freaky. I've he only is. seen him bounce balls for. I haven't really watched That's him for Frederick Stoffman, all you but need I've, to see. <laughs> I've watched him bounce balls for Cuba in warmups. Yeah, there there were a couple in game. Frederick Stoffman, by the way, I give their team a lot of credit. Their social media presence is very good. If you don't follow Friedrich Soffen's club on Instagram, you should. They do a super good job. And they've posted some in-game bounces from Maso that are like terrifying in a good way. So he's Love super that. physical. There's no way he'll make the Olympic roster behind like Simone, Alonso, and Concepcion. But uh, he's a nice prospect in the middle for Cuba. But yeah, Michal Superlock was the guy for Friedrich Soffen today. And uh, this was a good series, and I enjoyed watching it. And it's a bummer that... Um, unless I want to pay for the subscription, the I probably won't watch the rest. It's going to be behind a paywall. Yeah, it's a shame. That's a shame. It's a shame. You got to hate it. And another paywall that you want to watch is the French League. It is the French League. I forgot to pull up the latest, uh, the latest bracket in the French League, but uh, they are on to the semis. Um, Torquang beat Toulouse in the fifth match to get there then promptly lost the first match of the semis to St. Nazaire. So St. Nazaire, the seven seed, is one match away from the final, which is very impressive. Also a good example of how stupid that playoff format is. Going from best of five yeah, in the quarters to best of three I, in the semis is insane. I, I would agree with that, but I also think it's an indication of just how even the French League is. Um, like, it, 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 There's just so much parity uh, across that league. So, But I, I agree. 
Also, San Jose is a balling team. They're good, man. Kyle Ensing, Jordan Ewart, that uh, Spencer Helder guy, or Helder, Helden Spencer, Quinn Isaacson, Jordan Schnitzer. You got to love it. Uh, Karts have stood up to 23 for Tokoin uh, in this match. Uh, Ensing with 17, Ewart with 14, Schnitzer with 9. Um, so that's a big win there by uh, San Jose. And uh, on the other side, in the 1-4 series, which honestly may as well be the final, Chaumont versus Tours. Tours stole the first one, 15-12 in the fifth. So uh, Chaumont now needs to win two matches in a row uh, in the revenge game from last year's final. And here's something that confuses me. How exactly did Luciano Polonski, who we love on this channel, he's a buddy, how did he end up playing back for Tours just in time to win them this match in the seventh? The French League has that rule, remember? Remember when, like, a couple years ago, when they, they did the... Back when uh, Sclater and Demianenko were playing for Montpellier and they dominated all year, and then Chaumont had, like, Maguerejo and, and Herrera and Yant, I'm pretty sure. Maybe not Yant, but definitely Maguerejo and Herrera. And uh, and they brought in... Uh, what's his face? Beautiful hair. Lanza? Lanza. Yeah, they, they brought in Lanza to beat... Uh, to beat them oh no they and they also had steven marshall on that team that, that, that's what that's i remember what that, that team that, but yeah like happened. what are we doing the, the what are we league, doing allowing a transfer before the semifinals of the playoffs well they they have they have a rule where that like if you have a starting player who gets injured in the playoffs you can go get a rent a player that's so like emily crazy. emily Maglio, Emily Maglio got signed by Paris St. Cloud, Paris St. Cloud for the playoffs coming in from Besiktas in the, in the Tur- Turkish league so yeah, like the French league just has that, and I mean for for Polonsky, that's just the perfect situation. He's played there the past hey, few seasons. He played there last year. You're just going back to going back to the homies, and that rule know, just, sucks. It, it, that rule I agree. Sucks. It it is a terrible, awful, it, horrendous it for is, competitive balance. It's completely unfair. Yeah, absolutely. And we right? love Polonsky. He's the homie. But I've, I've, I, uh, if Shomon doesn't win this series, it is it's kind of bullshit. Yeah. I would fully agree. I mean, Polonsky was all right in this one, or actually, he was pretty damn good. Uh, There's no for, way Tours wins that match 20. without Polonsky. There's no way they win that match without yeah. him. Yeah, because they lost, uh, what's his, his face up? Uh, Potron, the young kid who's really good, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it, it's wild. Like, I hate that rule. Be less Bush I, League volleyball. Figure it out. Yeah. God, can't stand it. What do you What do you guys think in the chat? What, what, is, what does the chat think? Yeah, is, I mean, these people... These people are European. They 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 are used to dumb rules in sports and allowing people to do stuff like this. We in real sports in North America, this is like not even thinkable. Same with like transfers midseason, not even thinkable. Um, all right, we do trades. Well, yeah, we. I mean, like talking about building next year's roster in the middle of the current season is yeah. complete is completely insane. All right, uh, last but not least. We need to talk about the men's NCAA, Everett, and uh, we don't cover that this month. We don't don't cover the men's NCAA that much on this show. Yeah. Um, we, be- we 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 like to cover the playoffs. We do That's same with we, same with U Sports. Same with U Sports. We treat it the exact same. And uh, it's time. It is time for the the men's NCAA playoffs because it is conference tournament week. Uh, this time next week, we will know the the field for the men's NCAA tournament. And uh, it's and you got the Miva conference bracket up right here. But um, what we got to talk about first is that there is a new format for the men's NCAA tournament this year. It is eight Ooh. teams. Oh, finally. It should it should be more. We can discuss that in a second, especially <laughs> yeah. with Conference Carolinas and the SEAC just getting just. Yeah. yeah, the Conference Carolinas and the SEAC getting auto bids when there will only be two at-large teams is a little bit insane. So that it does sound like there's uh, there's progress in moving the men's NCAA tournament to 12 teams, mm-hmm. which would be great and I think would be a perfect number. But uh, in the meantime, we've got four – or well, really, we've got six conference tournaments this week that will award auto bids. Only four of them really matter because the Conference Carolinas and the SEAC, unfortunately for those teams, they will not be relevant at the NCAA tournament level. I do I do have to say, though, Rob, I think it's extremely important for, for the growth of men's volleyball in the NCAA for those conferences to get the bids. Agreed. Right now. Right. right? Like, it's 
it 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 needs to be it needs to be a carrot for conferences to be willing to come into men's volleyball to be like, hey, guess what? You're going to get an automatic bid to the national championships, right? Because no, that, that doesn't, I agree that doesn't that. always happen, right? It's it's it is a necessary evil. It does suck, but just as you said, it just proves the necessity that this needs to be a longer tournament that's actually paid attention to and actually respected a little bit. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly the point. Like, whoever wins the SEAC, this will be the first year ever that that conference gets a bid, and that's awesome. Like, the fact yeah. that, that that conference will be represented at the NCAA level, level is a good thing. However, the team just won't be competitive, whereas there will be at least two very good teams from the West Coast that will be left out of this tournament, and that's where I have the issue. It's not that, like, those teams don't, those conferences don't deserve representation. I just don't like them getting bids over teams that actually have a chance to win it. And so we'll talk about that in a second. But the, the Miva here um, in the Midwestern part of the United States, they're only going to get one team in the tournament, and that's going to be the team that wins the conference tournament because it's been kind of a bloodbath this year. There isn't a team that really can quite punch up there with the big boys in the West. So uh, Ball State versus Lindenwood and Ohio State versus Loyola, that's the semis. Whoever wins, honestly, it's a coin flip. I have no idea. You don't think – but like Loyola beat Hawaii earlier this year. And I know like they, they split that series, but you don't think that they even have a, a have a bit of a shot? Loyola has one really good player in Parker Van Buren. He's a big superstar opposite. He played for the USA B team last summer up in Edmonton, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, th- um, I think I, I vaguely remember. Is he yeah, a big, big tall blonde kid. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. really good. He's really physical. He was the Miva player of the year, but uh, he's basically Loyola's entire team. And but so is Jacob Pastor for Ohio State. So like those two going against each other will be fun. Ball State like is Pastor. me too. He Ball has, State is the best team. Around. Ball State is the best okay. team of these four. But whichever one wins, I don't really like their chances at the NCAA level. I predict whoever wins the Miva will probably get like the sixth seed at what NCAA is this year. Uh, they were the sixth seed in the Miva tournament, and they lost to Ohio State. They weren't super good. Oh wow, weird. So yeah, someone's going to win the Miva. That per- that team will get a bid, and nobody else will. Same similar story with the EIVA. Um, this is absolutely Penn State's conference to lose this year. George Mason is good, uh, but Penn State did go undefeated in conference. They went a perfect ten and zero. So if if anybody other than Penn State won this conference tournament, it would be an upset. Yeah, I mean, it's it's normal for Penn State and Pav to win the EVA. And I know he doesn't like it when I call it the EVA. But Kevin Barnett taught me it otherwise. So <laughs> I'm going to call it, call it the EVA. Um, I like seeing Penn State good. I wish the EVA was a little bit better. Charleston wasn't as good as they, as they were last year. Um, Princeton, Harvard kind of lo- losing some guys as, as well, too. So from what I've seen, looks like Penn State is probably going to take the, the EVA as well. Yeah, Penn State is good, but they're not going to be as like they're not going to be as much of a threat nationally as they were last year. No, like that that team they had last year. I think they lost a semi to hmm, might have been either UCLA. It was either UCLA or Hawaii. I'm pretty sure Penn State made it to the semis and it was a good match. But uh, this this team year this year is not as good as last year's team. Lost Cole Bogner. They lost Brett Wildman. Um, they lost Cal Fisher. They just lost a bunch of dudes. Uh, Toby Ezionu is one of my favorite middles in the country, but um, he, he's they lo- who else did they lose? They, they lost to Hawaii in five last year. That's it. That was it. I remember that. That was a great semi. Uh, but yeah, this is probably Penn State's conference to lose. Uh, we're not going to talk about the Conference Carolinas or the SEAC, but where it gets interesting is out on the West Coast. There are two conferences out on the West Coast. There's the Big West. We see the tournament field here. There's also the MPSF. Now, there are six very good teams that are split between these two conferences that I believe are the top six teams in the country. In no particular order, that's Long Beach State, Hawaii, UC Irvine, UCLA, Grand Canyon, and BYU. Just because of the way the NCAA tournament is set up, whoever wins the Big West and the MPSF tournament is going to get an auto bid. Then there will only be Mm -hmm. two at-large spots left for and some two of those six teams that i just said will take those spots there will be at least two very very good teams that do not make the ncaa tournament and one of those teams could very well be hawaii hawaii had an embarrassing loss getting swept by uc san diego over the weekend uh i think they've dropped down to fifth in the abca rankings hawaii's best chance at this point is their eighth in the ncaa rankings Eighth? eighth i'm looking at them right now yeah Wow. Uh, so Hawaii's best chance at this point is to win the Big West tournament. However, they get to do that at home. 
So uh, Hawaii is hosting the Big West tournament. If they beat Santa Barbara, Irvine, and then probably Long Beach, uh, they will. Uh, they would definitely earn the spot. But uh, if, if, they, if, uh, if they lose to Irvine in the semis, it's over. It's done. It's, yeah, it's, if they if they don't make the final, like you're right, they have to. It would be an interesting toss up because Irvine is way higher. Irvine's ranked fourth in the NCAA finals, and I believe that they're sorry the rankings. And I believe the NCAA rankings runs off of the RPI that they use to determine those those bid spots. Yeah, so, RPI is a big one. There, there's several like sort of metrics that there's a committee of people that subjectively decides who deserves the spots, but RPI is a big yeah. one. And uh, when, when you look at like UCLA, like UCLA and, and Grand Canyon, both from the MPSF are one, two, and then Long Beach and UC Irvine are three, four, both from the big West. You'd assume that if those four teams, if those two teams, like or four teams meet each other in the, their respective conference tournaments, that whoever loses is just going to get this. This is just going to get in. Yeah. yeah. So like both BYU and Hawaii, I think in, at five and six right now, in no particular order, they need to win their conference tournaments. Uh, to to get into the NCAA's and that's a bummer for Hawaii because they were number one in the country at some point this year. The problem was that they lost the potent their potential national player of the year outside hitter Spiros Hawkins to a knee injury, and when he went out, they they about a month ago they just haven't quite been the same. So they're gonna definitely gonna have to pull some magic at home uh, in the Big West tournament. Irvine is very good. Uh, Irvine's cool because they have hawaii's former libero setting for them brett oh Sheward. really i didn't know that yeah brett Sheward played he, brett Sheward was libero at hawaii after gage worsley and now and then he was a grad transfer at irvine as their starting setter this year which is really sweet but hilir heno yeah. will win national player of the year big french left-handed outside hitter he's kind of micheletto like he's not that good but he's they're like built kind of similarly and uh heno's numbers this season have been outrageous and we were talking in the Discord earlier today that Hilir Heno's little brother might even be better than him. Uh, Matisse, really? Which is insane. <laughs> yeah. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and But Long Beach State is number one in the country right now. I'm not sure that they should be. I think oh. on, the, I, on the eye test, I'm not quite as impressed by them. They do have... Who, uh, my, who are my, you more impressed than by the eye test? Like what, what team looks like it's the best team for you? Maybe UCLA. And the UCLA is the number one in the country according to the coaches poll this week, but they have but they have their own issues, which we'll talk about in a second. Long Beach is good; they have four good wings they can use. They have Simon Torwe, who might be the best middle in the country. Uh, Mason Briggs might be the best libero in the country; she probably is. And uh, I think Aiden Knipe is good. He's not as good as. He's probably the fourth best setter in the country, but he's perfectly I, good. I rate Aiden Knight. I know you do. I, I know you I, like him. I've I've seen I've I've seen him play live, and I, I he's just a grinder. He re- reminds me a lot of Sean McKay from Western, just like and he has he you can tell he knows the game. Uh, also, big shout out to Skylar Varga. Yeah, Canadian. Uh, Canadian who's been holding it down on the right side. It's funny because like his backup, I'm pretty sure, is Daniil Hurstinovich, who's a, another Canadian who's a first year uh, over there, over there as well. So I'm I'm personally pulling for Long Beach. You know, we got that that Canadian connection. Um, well, obviously, once again, uh, the national player of the year will once again be a foreign, foreign player yep. in, in in the NCAA. That's a um, hell of a streak that we have going on and not a good one in my Not opinion. a good one. No. Uh, sir, Long Beach, no. by the way, Long Beach and Irvine just played over the weekend and they swept each other in back-to-back nights. They split Ooh, the series. I like that. I like that spiciness. Me too. And uh, so on the MPSF side, our last conference we got to talk about, uh, UCLA is the one seed um, and Grand Canyon is the other team in this conference that deserves an at-large bid to NCAAs, in my opinion. They're really good. Um, they've both made a lot of roster moves this year. UCLA is so weird, man, because they won they won the national championship a year ago. They graduated one player. Yes. Only their libero, Troy Gooch, who was the only player that left them. And they have been a transformationally different team this year, and Spira has not been able to figure out who he's going to start. They have played five different liberos this year. But this is what UCLA does every year. It's just a rotating door, a revolving door of just people coming in and coming through. And it's just, it, it, it's always the case with Spraw's UCLA teams. It's always the case. Hell, even last year, they won with like that, like who was Norris the third, whatever, playing in they the are Norris. Yeah, they, 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 they subbed in a third middle in the national championship game and he played great. Yeah, so they've played, they've played like four outsides this year. They've played two opposites. Like they're, 
Um, they're, they're, they have two Israeli kids, Ido David on the right side and Guy Guinness in the middle. And both of them won national championships last year, and both of them have been benched at this point. And they had uh, Alex Knight, who last year was the MVP of the NCAA tournament at outside hitter, and he's been relegated to the reception-only libero this year. Because this kid on your screen, Cooper Robinson, is so good. And Ethan Champlin, in my opinion, is the best American player in the NCAA. Probably even better than Andrew Rowan, who's their setter, who's amazing. So, uh, yeah, UCLA is good. It seems like they may have just finally figured out what lineup they're going to play. We'll see if they can win the conference tournament. Grand Canyon is good, too. Uh, they were number one in the country at, at a point this year, and they deserve a spot. So what's what's the vibe with Grand Canyon, Rob? Because I, and so just just a little preface is why I'm asking this question is because I've just been seeing some comments. And I, there was also a, a little out of system video where they're doing stereotypes of all of the players around the country and the stereotype of the Arizona players, hence the, the GCU players, was that, you know, they very physical but just didn't necessarily have the skill to play with the California guys. Is, is that the case? You could argue that. Uh, I, I definitely think Grand Canyon, are, are they like a legitimate national title contender? No, I wouldn't say so. Uh, are they, do they deserve to go to the NCAA tournament? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, they're 21 and four two. I think three of their losses on the season are to UCLA. So like the, or no, I guess it would only be, they got, crushed by ucla in la about two weeks ago in two matches i can't remember who their other two losses are to, but uh yeah they they lost the in those two matches oh, they, lost, yeah. they, they, they got a three Hawaii. dunk and then they and then they lost in five to ucla yeah earlier in the year I, I remember now grand canyon got to number one in the country then they traveled to hawaii lost to hawaii and lost to irvine so they've yeah, only they lost to good teams but like those are the teams that you have to beat in a national championship situation and i'm not sure that gcu can um they moved camden gianni back from the right side to the left side where he started his career so he's moved back and forth a time or two and gcu has a setter named nick slight that i love he's really good I think he's the second best setter in the country behind Andrew Rowan. So Nick Slight is very, very good, and uh, he can—he's the sort of setter that can will a team to winning something like the MPSF tournament. But I think they—they they definitely do lack the ball control and defensive ability to win a national title. But I still think they deserve an at-large spot if it comes to it. Okay. Wow. Dude, Gianni had a heart attack last year. He did. He did. Wild. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, I remember that it was a scary situation. He's come back from it hundred percent, which is great to see. Also uh, Concordia Irvine is quite bad. Oh, and 11 in conference. And uh, just a funny typo that I just noticed pepper fine. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Oops. Pepper fine. Pepper dying, by the way, is not doing pepper fine lately. Cause they just lost to an NAIA team like two weeks ago. So that's not good. Oh, that's not good. There's that's a couple of Canadians good. on pepper dying, including Cole Ketrzynski. Yeah. Cole's there as a grad transfer. Um, so yeah, USC is hosting the MPSF tournament this week, but USC is not good. So they're probably going to be a non-factor and see if Stanford can make a little miracle run, but they're probably also a non-factor. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, selection Sunday is this Sunday. I think there's a sort of selection show going down uh, on at the NCAA's website where they will unveil the tournament. And I think it's a good time to tell the people uh, a cool piece of news that uh, I get to go to Long Beach State for the NCAA tournament, and I will be on the mic calling the games for all four quarterfinals and both semifinals. It's it's kind of wild that they're getting you to do all of that work and then they're just like handing the finals off to Barnett and Sunderland. To Barnett I mean like Sunderland. I get it. It's Barnett and Sunderland. <laughs> they are the best. Are you allowed to like are you, like cuz I'm assuming that they're like paying for you to go down. Do you get to stay for the finals? I haven't decided yet. Uh one reason which is that the men's NCAA championship game is I think it's on Saturday afternoon, May 4th. Mm. You, you know it's the next day after that? What's that? The Champions League final. <laughs> Uh, but both Champions League finals are that Sunday, and I might have uh, some obligations for that that we'll tell you guys about later, which could be pretty fun. But uh, yeah, I would like to stay for the final and maybe fly home right afterwards. We'll see. But at the very least, I get to call some men's NCAA, and I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to you talk to take a red eye for that. The, 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 the game is at like 2 p.m. Pacific, so it's not even that bad if, if I wanted to fly back that night. We'll see if I can pull it off. But okay. uh yeah, I am. Ex I'm excited about that. I've I've been. Um, if any of you know my 
commentary background. I've looked up to Paul Sunderland for my whole life, and I'm excited. Oh, to, really? You yeah. just call the game exactly like him? Yeah, it's because he's the best. He, I'm, I'm a little less of a curmudgeon old man than he is at this point in his he's career. He's such a curmudgeon. A bit of a curmudgeon. Dude, there's, been, there's been, like, back in the day when he used to do World League, like, he used to do, like, the World League Finals. Yeah, he was so good. He was very good, but then he would just go into these curmudgeon modes, like, I wouldn't have done that. That's not what I would have done. That's just a terrible decision. I'm just like, you have no idea about, like, what their plans are, what their schemes are, what their decisions are, are, are doing. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he was just harping on one thing, and I was like, it's clear they're not playing that game plan, but he is still one of the best. And I, I like, as much as you are a Paul Sunderland guy, I'm a Kevin Barnett guy. I know you are. Barney is the I, man. I grew up, for me, it was Kevin Barnett on the net live. I I wanted to be in volleyball because of listening to the net live. Like I wanted to be a part of volleyball and uh I got to go on the net live a couple of times. One time I went over to Barnett's house. He got mad at me for putting a banana peel on his nice leather couch. Um <laughs> but uh but yeah, it uh it's they're the best duo in volleyball and I wish they're that the, best the FIVB would actually pay them properly so that they could do oh, it. But, yeah, that's never going to happen. Uh, we do though get Sunderland and Barnett for the Olympics this summer on NBC if you're in the States. So um, get ready for that. Also, at least last year, Sunderland and Barnett called the finals of the Big West tournament. Because uh, uh, I think Hawaii beat Long Beach last year in that final and they called the game and it was very good and um, so we'll see if they if they dip their toe into that or they just jump right into the NCAA championship match. Either way, uh, that's going to be a good time coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll talk about the NCAA tournament field on next week's show. Oh, last but not least, there's something I get to do uh, this coming weekend, which is very cool. And that's that I get to go and do a lot of the broadcasting for the NCVF National Championship. This is the National Collegiate Volleyball Federation. This is this the, the entity that governs American University Club Volleyball, which is it's the like level. It's, it's like yeah. D5 for those ones. <laughs> it's the level that I played at uh, when I went when I played at Purdue. And uh, we'll be in Kansas City for nationals, uh, which is where actually two of my five nationals were when I was playing. The only thing that I can describe, the only way I can describe this to you, Everett, is that the finals... Are it the it the same vibe as Wapaka? See, like I, I think it would same be electric. I, I think it would be electric to go. It's it's the, the it's I, the best atmosphere I've ever seen in volleyball. Uh, yeah, ever for sure. I, I think it would be electric to go. I think it would be you know like that type of community ball is always so much fun to me because that's what it is. It's it's, it's community. It like, is this like, this event, the NCVF National Championship, breaks its own record for the largest collegiate sporting event in the world every year. Every year it gets bigger and every year it breaks its own world record. And this is this will be think of it, every single university in America will have at least one men's team and at least one women's team. Like Purdue, for example, will have two men's teams and three women's teams playing at Oh really? Game. I didn't I thought it was just men. But men oh, and women. Men. men and women. It is gigantic. That's, it that is, sounds like the that's vibe party, is insane. It? The party atmosphere how is many, unbelievable. How many volleyball babies are conceived that week? <laughs> uh, a non-zero number. Uh, there, there, are some, a non, a non there are some. There are some marriages that started from NCVF nationals hookups. I know of a couple. Like it, it happens. Uh, the basically what you do like Saturday is single elimination, and as soon as you lose, the party starts immediately. Everybody comes to the women's D1 final and the men's D1 final. The atmosphere is unbelievable, and I will be there. I'll be calling the games. We're streaming live on YouTube, and our, our guy Michael Wooten from Texas is coming up to run the broadcast. So it'll be same broadcast style, same production quality as we did at Norseca in West Virginia. Love it. It's very Love good. It. So well, uh, the NCVF has a YouTube channel. That's where it'll be. I'll be there. Uh, the atmosphere is insane, and you should tune in. The, the, level, of, if, the level of ball is okay. There, there are some good players that come out of the NCVF, like some that go overseas and like have good collegiate club career or like have good pro careers. Uh, but like the the teams are like fun, but not like NCAA level. They could definitely compete at the NCAA D three level. But the the atmosphere in the final on Saturday night will be amazing. All right. Well then, you guys should check that out. Um, all righty. Is that it for the show? Um, Ooh, I think that's it for the show. Tomorrow, I'm going to do 
I might do it live, but I might just film it. But I'm going to do a breakdown of Canada's 18-man AT roster that they met, uh, released at the end of uh, last week. So I'll, I'll be doing that. Uh, make sure we've got um, Wednesday, we've got the Polish uh, semifinals going down with the uh, Italian League finals, women's finals starting up on Wednesday. And then you've got the uh, Italian League final starting up on Thursday. Yep. Uh, Turkish women, I think their next game is Thursday as well. And then uh, over the weekend, like Saturday, will be uh, the Polish semifinal second leg. And then we'll be back on Monday to talk about all the latest, just like always. Yep. Oh. All right. We will see you later. Thanks for watching, people.